All right, in this video, we're going to be looking at how uh, the environment can impact enzyme function. We're going to be looking at how changes in the environment can do that, also different molecules that can affect enzyme function. One big concept here that we have to look at is this idea of conformational shape. Conformational shape is um, basically just a, another word for the tertiary shape of a protein. The, you know, this is the shape that the enzyme makes when it is going to do the work. So it's protein is made. This has an active site for the substrate. We've talked about this. And this particular enzyme is taking these two things apart and making some products. You get the idea. Changes in this conformational shape are called denaturation. Denaturation is essentially the protein that has a shape and a particular function comes apart. There are a couple of things that can cause denaturation directly. One of them is temperature, and the other one is pH, and we'll be talking about those in turn. Uh, denaturation is usually irreversible, meaning that the, um, the shape can't be fixed. You know, a great example of this is like when you cook eggs, the albumin protein in eggs is irreversibly changed. You can't uncook an egg. Uh, there are instances in which uh, an enzyme's shape can be changed and function can be returned. We're actually going to mention one of those in this lecture. So how does temperature affect this? Well, all enzymes have an optimal temperature range, that range in which the enzyme is working best. You can kind of see here, as the temperature increases, the rate of reaction also increases and it gets to a point where the rate is at its peak, and this is that optimal temperature. And then as it increases further, it completely drops off. And so this would represent the denaturation of that enzyme because the temperature is so much so that the enzyme is just not working at all. And so you can see here that this enzyme has an optimal range that it works in. Um, the big idea here is that um, when you increase temperature, you increase molecular movement. The increase in molecular movement causes those enzymes and substrates to collide at greater frequency, thus increasing the rate of reaction. However, once you get to a certain point, obviously the, the enzyme will change shape and denature, and the enzyme and substrate can no longer function. Uh, decreases in temperature generally slow down reaction rate. Um, doesn't necessarily disrupt the structure of the enzyme, but it can. There are examples of that. Um, so let's move on to pH. pH is the concentration of hydrogen ions in solution, um, typically um, denoted in this scale here from 0 to 14, whereas 0, or the lowest end of this, is acidic and has the highest concentration of hydrogen ions in solution. And basic solutions have the lowest, uh, lowest concentration of hydrogen ions in solution, or you could say the highest concentration of hydroxide ions in solution. But mostly, uh, when you're talking about pH, you are talking about concentrations of hydrogen ions in solution. And these numbers increase uh, by factors of 10. So if you go from 7 to 6, it's 10 times more. If you go from 7 to 5, it's 100 times more. And so the change from like pH 5, which is like coffee, to pH 1, which is like hydrochloric acid, is a dramatic change in levels of uh, hydrogen ions in solution. And the numbers of hydrogen ions in solution can directly affect the bonding of structures of the enzyme, right? Because a lot of bonds in enzymes are hydrogen bonds, those, especially those secondary structures. And so those hydrogen bonds can be directly disrupted by the presence of ions in the solution. And so this is an example of what optimal pH for an enzyme looks like. Pepsin, which is a stomach enzyme, operates at a very low pH because the stomach has a low pH. Once it gets outside of either one of those ranges, enzyme function dramatically decreases and then stops because of denaturation. You see here the intestinal enzymes work at a more basic range, the pH of 8. And so the same sort of thing as these food in the stomach enters into the intestines, that pepsin enzyme is going to completely break down. It's going to denature. It's no longer going to be functioning. And so just like temperature, pH has an optimum range. A couple other points to note. Uh, substrate concentration can directly affect the rate of reaction as well. This should make sense. If there's more substrate, there's more reaction going on. However, there is a load point at which 
you can't really go faster. It's uh, the way I think about it is uh, in a restaurant, if the restaurant is full and there are people waiting outside to eat, the people inside can only work at a certain rate and people can only eat at a certain rate. It's not just because more people show up doesn't mean that it's going to happen faster. And so at a certain point, um, substrate concentration will kind or the rate will level off with substrate concentration because it's not going to affect the rate just by adding more molecules to the pile. There's just too many because matter takes up space, right? Um, and you also might see a re reaction rate like this as substrate runs out, right? Because the reaction rate will kind of level off. It's no longer increasing or decreasing. And so um, you may also see that sort of look graph. Now, if you increase the amount of enzyme, this is directly proportional with rate. As you increase the amount of things that are working, you increase the amount of work that is done. So enzyme is doing the work of breaking down or building up the substrate. And then the amount of that work that is being done is increasing along with that enzyme concentration. So those two things we would say are directly proportional to one another. And then lastly, we're going to talk about this idea of inhibitors. An inhibitor is a molecule that stops enzyme function. It could be an on-purpose thing in that the body creates an inhibitor in order to stop enzyme function, or it could be some sort of foreign inhibitor that is causing um, this sort of function to cease. You know, there's uh, lots of examples of this. Carbon monoxide is an example of an inhibitor that stops cellular respiration. Uh, it's not an on-purpose thing the body's trying to do. So a competitive inhibitor is, a, is an inhibitor or a molecule that binds directly with the active site. You can think of it as it is competing for the active site on the enzyme, and this would stop function, obviously, because the substrate can no longer bind because this competitive inhibitor also binds with that site. I think of it as if I have a rubber glove and that rubber glove uh, put, fits my hand in there, if I stick a pencil into one of the fingers of that rubber glove, I can no longer use the rubber glove because that pencil is competing with the glove. I can't use it. So that's like a competitive inhibitor. The non-competitive inhibitor is where there's a, another site on the enzyme that uh, upon binding to that site causes a conformational shape change in the active site. So a non-competitive inhibitor is typically binds to what is known as an allosteric site, which allosteric literally means different shape site. And so it, once it binds to that, it, causes, it changes the molecular composition of the enzyme, thus changing the shape of the enzyme, and the substrate can no longer bind. Um, this could be an on-purpose thing, because you know this sort of thing can change the shape, and then if you can dissolve the non-competitive inhibitor, the enzyme will return to its normal function. This uh, can be a way to um, control the rate of reaction of enzymes in the body. Uh, bacteria will use this uh, in different things, like just whether or not to control transcription of DNA. It's a good example of this. You know, the, the inhibitor will bind to those transcription enzymes and pause um, pause transcription or cause it to happen. And so this, this is a non-competitive inhibitor, which causes a conformational shape change, binds to an allosteric site.